So it's time for me to take a break. See you later. Now we'll hand it over to my colleague, Koi. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I hope you are enjoying like everybody is doing here in the staff. And I would like to introduce our new speaker. So it's uh, Juan Lopez de la Franca. Uh, he's a computer engineer, passionate about software engineering and operations. And he's a co-founder of Ryan of uh, Friends of Go Community. And he's really breaking things at Cabify. I hope not too many things. <laughs> he's also a junior speaker and trainer. And he's currently studying an economics degree and willing to contribute to more uh, open source projects. So I hope you find something interesting to do after these talks. And welcome. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. So uh, let's start. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the conference organization for such an awesome initiative, because these days are being uh, very hard, and it's very pleasant to have the opportunity of spending a Sunday morning confinement here. So thank you very much. And as you can see here, I thought to spend one minute to presenting myself, but as Koi has already presented me, I think we can skip the slides. Basically, here are there are my Twitter and GitHub handles. And as today I'm going to be speaking about uh, Google Programming Language Go, I would like to, to spend just one minute to present Friends of Go, a Spanish-speaking Go community that Adrián Pérez, my partner, and me built at the very beginning of the last year. Uh, today we have uh, more than 700 followers, which is not bad for a, a Spanish-speaking community on Twitter. We also have written more than 60 blog posts. Uh, which is also not bad. Uh, if you have any dope, you're uh, starting with Go or whatever, you can go there and look for whatever you want to learn. And if you find something missing, you can ping us and propose any topic that will be uh, very welcome. Also, we are doing in-person and online trainings. And sometimes when we have free time, <laughs> it's not very common. Uh, we write some open source code, and our most stable project is Killgriff, that it's a mock server, uh, which I really recommend you to, to have a look at it. And that's all about spam. <laughs> so now it's time to work. And my first duty before I start talking about Go is to let you know what you can expect, expect from this talk. Because even on, on this confinement situation, uh, some of you might not be interested in this talk. So I'd like to clarify what this talk gonna be about and what not in order to help you with your decision. But I hope you, you will <laughs> remain here. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a bit about cookies, but not about the technical concept, uh, but the sweetie one. <laughs> also, uh, this talk about context is gonna be more or less of a junior level, but not from scratch. So I'm gonna suppose uh, you uh, the, the audience can more or less follow the code, understand what is a function, more or less, etc. And uh, I'm gonna talk, as the title says, I'm gonna talk about the context package, which is uh, a standard package in the standard library of Go. But I'm gonna not talk about any other framework because there are a lot of uh, web frameworks that use this context that has their own, their own context. And there are also some other packages like error group that also use this, this package, but it, will, it won't be included in this talk. So I'm gonna talk only about this standard library package context. Okay, so as I said, let's talk about cookies because these days uh, that we cannot go out, uh, are very good days to make some cookies, I think. So in order to make cookies, first of all, uh, we need to define which ingredients we are gonna, uh, we are gonna need to, to do the cookies uh, in order to buy them, of course. So to buy these ingredients, I'm gonna rely on these pretty and simple gophers, which are the Go programming language mascot. And I'm pretty sure that they are going to do their job perfectly. So, I started writing some Go code. As you can see here, uh, first of all, I uh, find a, uh, a data structure 
gopher that basically will contain uh, the ingredient uh, he has to buy. Then we have a buy method that basically simulates a shopping time and a method to initialize each gopher, basically to tell them uh, which ingredient has to buy. And on our main function, we have a, the list of ingredients and a loop for each ingredient to instantiate each gopher and to tell them, hey, buy, buy the ingredient and tell me if everything, if you could find the ingredient or not. If I run this code, it's gonna work, but it's gonna be executed sequentially. So the next gopher won't go until the previous one has come back in this in this line. Exactly. And this is not a desirable situation for these days where we must spend as less time as possible for go, going shopping. So I changed a bit this code. And basically I instantiated a new weight group that is a goal data structure that helps us to manage uh, go routines with different threads. And the idea here is to dispatch an, a new go routine. So uh, and we can understand a go routine as a thread. There are some differences, but we won't uh, go inside this. Uh, so the idea is to dispatch a new thread, a new function for each gopher uh, that basically does almost the same as we see previously. Uh, and finally, we are gonna wait for for all the gophers to to come back and tell us if if they could uh, find the, the ingredient or not. But here we have a problem because this code is gonna run concurrently, but there's still a missing thing. We have no way to let gophers to tell, it, to tell us whether they could uh, find or not the ingredient. So I change a bit uh, this code. Now I have to find another data structure that I called it SMS that basically contains the ingredient of, um, if there was an error or not while trying to buy this ingredient. Now it's gopher, apart from the ingredient to buy, we're gonna have also a, a mobile that will be passed on the, in, on the constructor method. So when they come uh, to, when they go buy uh, the, the ingredients, they will be able to send us an SMS and tell us, hey, I, I found the ingredient or not. At the moment, we are returning always nil error because we are supposing that they always can uh, uh, find, find the ingredient. On this new version, the main function basically defines what I call the mobile, which is a channel, which is a, a Go resource. And basically, I'm also dispatch, uh, I'm still dispatching a new Go routine for each ingredient. And basically, what I added here is another loop in order to let, uh, uh, in order to wait for each gopher uh, to send us back uh, an SMS uh, in order to inform if there was an error or not while, go, while going shopping. So all right, uh, this code is gonna run perfectly on an ideal situation, but uh, there's a concept that probably most of you already know that are the fallacies of distributed computing from Lawrence Peter Deutsch, which as you can see uh, with these examples, they basically tell us that shit gonna happen. In our case, there's no network, but our current situation could be could become on, on some undesired situations because with this coronavirus lockdown situation, uh, a gopher might find the shop closed. There could be some missing ingredients. A gopher might also be stopped by a police control or eventually he can start suffering coronavirus symptoms uh, and need to go to the hospital. So uh, we need some kind of gopher supervision. Uh, in order to tell them if something unexpected happened. For example, if we couldn't find floor, to, 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 to say an example, then we won't be able to make cookies. So in that situation, I think the best choice is to uh, tell the other gophers to come back to home to, uh, to stay safe and don't spend more, more time trying to find the other ingredients. And for that purpose is where 
the context package uh, comes to Risqui. And basically, uh, this package, the, the main content, the main component, sorry, of this package is uh, this interface context, so context.context, .context, uh, that defines multiple methods. But now, in order to achieve what uh, we defined previously, uh, we are going to focus on these two methods. The first one is a method that returns a channel that is going to receive a signal when the context gets cancelled or when the deadline is over. And the second one is a method that is going to return the error if so. Now we can adapt our previous code, you know, especially the by method, in order to, uh, to receive a context. And now we uh, are also spending the shopping time as previously, but now we have two possible cases. The first one is after spending some time on shopping, we can I, I add this function to randomly fail, fail or not. Uh, the shopping can be successful or not. But there's also another possible case that is when the context gets uh, uh, it's done. So for example, when it gets canceled. Now we are going to, to see how this could happen. But the idea is this, that uh, if a gopher is spending time over there uh, shopping, finding the ingredient, whatever, and he uh, gets this signal, he uh, will come back home uh, instead of still going there and trying to, to find the ingredient. And at the end, we're still uh, sending us uh, an SMS. So here we could be able to to know if the gopher has all uh, has find the ingredient, if not, or he could also find uh, tell us if he are coming back home because he received the cancellation. <laughs> okay, now we have to, uh, to to instantiate the context that we are going to pass to this by method, and to do that we have uh, two main functions on the context package. The first one is the with cancel uh, method, and the second one is background. The first one basically initializes a context from another context and give us a cancellation function, so a way to cancel the context itself. And the second one is going to initialize a background or root context. Now, let's see an example about how these methods work. So <laughs> let's suppose we call the context.background method. We are going uh, in it, we're going utilizing a new context. And then if we uh, call uh, with the with cancel method, we're going to initialize a child of the background context. And we're also having uh, this cancel function that will let us in the future uh, cancel this, this context, okay? Now we can create, for example, another child from the same uh, root context. And then we can create uh, two more chips, one from each of the principal chips, having this uh, resulting hierarchy. And now we can start with the cancellation in order to see what will, what's going to happen when we cancel a context. First of all, if we cancel, if we run the cancel one method, so this one, the cancel method of the chip one, we are going to cancel this context and it's chilled, still it's chilling. So here we are also canceling also this chilled. On the opposite side, if we call the cancel 21, uh, as we can see here, we are going to cancel only the last chilled, which is the one that is directly canceled. So as it's important to, to keep clear that here the, 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 the RM context won't be affected as they are in, uh, immutable. So now that we more or less know how these uh, methods work, uh, we can adapt our previous code in order to uh, do the behavior that we have defined. So now we have more or less the structure that we've seen previously, but now we are defining a, a new context using the with cancel function that we, we've seen from a background parent. We are deferring the cancel that's 
just uh, to help the garbage collector to clean everything when we are finished with all the context stuff. And now we are passing uh, this context to the dispatch gopher function in order to pass it to the buy function. And basically what we're gonna do is each time we receive an SMS from a gopher, we are going to check if there was an error while, try, while trying to, to, to buy the ingredient. And if there was an error, uh, we cancel the context. So here we are telling all the other gophers, please come back. We have no flour, no fa we have no cho chocolate, whatever. So it has no sense to uh, still go in there and try to find the other ingredients because we, we cannot make cookies. <laughs> also, there are uh, two other functions that are really interesting on the context package that are with deadline and with timeout, which are pretty similar with the with can, with uh, the with cancel method that we've seen previously. But these ones, apart from returning us a cancel function, uh, it also uh, helps us to define a timeout. So for example, we can say, okay, uh, go first, you can go out, find the ingredients, uh, if something happened, unexpected happened, uh, I'm gonna tell you to come back home. But apart from this, in addition, I want to uh, you, these gophers to spend uh, a maximum of five seconds, for example, uh, trying to find the ingredients. Otherwise, I'm gonna tell them, okay, uh, go back home. These methods are pretty similar. The idea is that with one, you can find a deadline. So, for example, tomorrow uh, at 12 or a timeout, so a, a number, a, an amount of time uh, that the, a maximum time. Uh, okay, so now we can add up a bit the previous code, and now instead of using the, the with cancel method, we are using the with timeout again uh, from the, a background uh, context and defining these five seconds. So now the other code is the same, but in this case, if no error happens, but we, have, we haven't we have received all the SMS uh, before these five seconds, then all the context is gonna be canceled also, and all the offers will come back again. So uh, now uh, we have everything under control. So I'm pretty sure uh, gophers are going to the shop and buy all the ingredients. So now we can mix all of them and put it into the oven and let co cookies <laughs> uh, be cooked during the rest of the presentation. And we can uh, continue with some real world examples. The first one is very common. In this, in this example, uh, you can see, for example, let's suppose we are writing a gateway that needs to fetch data from different microservices. For example, let's suppose we are writing Google, a Google search that is going to find uh, what something uh, in different services regarding videos, uh, images, songs, whatever. So here we can see the code. Uh, of, the code that will correspond to the, the, the HTTP handler, so the controller that will do this task. And basically what we are doing here is defining a context with cancellation, as we've seen previously. And for each site that we are going, going to uh, fetch data, we are utilizing an HTTP client using this new request with context method from the HTTP pack package to initialize a new HTTP request with the, the context we have initialized previously. And we are going to do the request. Here, I'm ignoring the errors for the sake of simplicity, but obviously we can here do some kind of error handling. Finally, we are gonna be waiting for all the responses. And again, we can do some kind of logic like, okay, if, if one uh, result fails, uh, cancel the others, or the opposite. For example, we can use this pattern to uh, ask for, uh, for, date, for some data 
to some different services uh, or, or some different instances of the same service. And when the first one arrives, we can cancel the others because we already have the, the date. Okay, so this, as you can see, is a real world example that is pretty similar with our toy, <laughs> with, uh, toy code with uh, gophers. Another real world example uh, is the graceful shutdown of an HTTP server application. We can suppose that our server has some dependencies that has to be gracefully shut down. For example, some async backgrounds or a DB connection or message bus consumers, whatever. And in order to achieve it, we're going to follow these steps. First of all, we're going to listen to the interruption signal from the operating system. Then we're going to cancel the main context to tell the, ap the application that it has to shut down the server. And finally, we are going to start a new context with a timeout of, let's say, five seconds, which corresponds to telling the server, hey man, you have five seconds to the graceful shutdown, otherwise the application will gonna be killed. And the code that corresponds to, to these steps can be seen here. Basically, we are initializing another uh, cancel, uh, cancelable context. Then this code is just defining a way to uh, catch the interruption signal. And basically, once we get that signal, we print a log and cancel the context. So this corresponds to the second, the, the first step and the second one. Now here we can see how we initialize an HTTP server that basically has a single endpoint just for the sake of simplicity that returns a status okay uh, HTTP code. And we initialize the server with this HTTP handler and we call a self method, okay? This self method is defined here. And basically it does it calls the listen and serve method of the server, which basically starts the server. And this line will be blocking. So this function will be blocked here, serving the, the, the HTTP server. And the main thread of the serve function is going to be uh, stuck, get stuck here until the main context uh, is canceled. So until going back, until this function is called that it is going to happen when the interrupt signal arrives. So when that happens, this line will continue, the, the execution of this uh, function will continue. And here we are seeing the third step that basically consists on defining a with timeout um, context of five seconds, for example, we are deferring again to, to clean up memory after all. And basically, we are calling the shutdown method of the server passing this context. This way, we are telling the server, OK, uh, you have five seconds to shut down. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. Another real example is this uh, extract that I took from the official blog of Go, where you can find a, another good explanation of this package. And here, as you can see, they say, at Google, we require that Go programmers pass a context parameter as the first argument to every function on the call path between incoming and outgoing requests. So yeah, that's a, a very common thought after seeing how this uh, context stuff works of thinking, uh, okay, so now I have to add context everywhere. Well, as we can see here, uh, it has sense on those functions and cat get block or spend or spend too much time. And precisely related with this, the last real world example uh, shared by Jose Armesto during this week is that with the publication of Kubernetes 1.18, they have added their, their Go client by adding a context as a, the first parameter of each of the, uh, its methods. <laughs> so it's very funny because, as you pro probably uh, know, is these are uh, breaking changes. These are breaking changes. So <laughs> that's it. the situation is that that uh, they are, they have uh, also implemented uh, a tool that uh, do this rewrite of all of your code to adapt your methods to the new version of the, of the client. It's pretty funny. 
Okay, so we have seen uh, a lot of real world examples. And if we come back to the origin, if we go back to the origin, sorry, uh, there were some methods on the context interface that we ignored previously. It was because these methods were thought for other purposes. So let's see a simple example of how they work. On the other hand, we have the value method that basically uh, receives a key and returns the corresponding value, or nil if no exists. And on the other hand, we have the with value method with let, uh, that will let us initialize a new context with a new key value inside. So basically, we can see a simulation like the previous one. Basically, uh, we can initialize a new context. We can initialize a child from the previous one with a new key value inside, inside it. We can initialize another child from the previous child. And here, it's important to uh, be aware that the, uh, the context are uh, immutable. So if we call the value method with both keys, it's going to be returning the values. But if uh, we call the child one value method with author, it's going to return nil. Uh, some usages of this context feature are logging, tracing, metrics, and so on, but it's out of the scope of this introductory talk. And finally, and just to recap, I bring here you some tips and tricks as takeaways. So uh, first of all, do not use nil context. The context packet provides provide a to-do method instead to use it when we don't know really what kind of context we have to use. Remember to default cancellations to help the garbage collector do the cleanup. Do not store the context in a struct. Instead, uh, pass the context inside the function as we did with the by method. The unique exception is the HTTP request struct as we've seen uh, on the previous example. Do not use context as dependency containers and only put values that don't control the flow of execution. So that's all. Uh, thank you so much. And I let you, uh, I let hear some preferences. And thank you very um, much, John. So uh, I really liked the real world examples. And we have um, a few questions here for you. Uh, first one is, uh, can we have a bracket uh, context with different timeouts, each one? Yes, but we have to keep in mind that uh, if we go back, uh, it's a uh, hierarchy. So if we have, uh, so as we have here with, with cancel, we can do the same with timeouts. The problem here is that if we have, for, for example, uh, uh, timeout here that is smaller than the timeout of the uh, child of the of a child. This timeout always uh, will be uh, overpassed uh, than the the child one. But yeah, it has sense. For example, we can have a bigger timeout for the entire request, and then we can create another context with a smaller timeout to do the database uh, state uh, query, and they can both be different. Yeah, of course. Another question related also with uh, timeouts is uh, in a case you have a thread uh, with timeout that calls multiple go routines uh, with different timeout each one is uh, what is the best approach is like create a, a, a new context for each one yeah I think the the clear example the, the most clear example is the what I said for example if we have a, a, a new request, we want to define uh, the maximum time uh, we are going to spend for the entire request. And then we are going to create new context from this one with new timeouts specific for each task. For example, if we have to fetch data from some other API, we can create a new context from the previous one with, uh, with another timeout to the, the HTTP request. We can have another context for the uh, query to database and each context is going to happen uh, is going to have uh, its uh, its timeout but all of them has to uh, have the main um, the main context with its timeout uh, as its parent okay. and uh, last question is like do you think context values for dependency injection is a good idea no as i said on the on the last uh, slide it's not a really a good idea because it uh, it's not recommended because uh, it 
makes uh, the booing code and reading code really hard because uh, there are no uh, explicit dependencies, so it's it's really 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 unrecommend not recommended. Okay, so uh, there is no more question for now. Um, thank you very much, Juan. So we really enjoy your talk, and we are gonna be back in a few minutes. So thank okay. you. Thank you.